I want you to turn in your Bibles with me tonight just for one verse, and it's found in Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. Now, if you haven't come with a Bible, don't you be panicking. You, we, you listen as we read this verse together. Uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, and just the one verse tonight, and it's verse 19. Mark, chapter 5, and it's verse 19. Now, as you're turning over, I get a wee drop of the petrol in here. Keep me going. Lovely. Mark chapter 5, verse 19, How be it, it says, Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And we know that the Lord will bless that verse to our hearts this evening. In Mark chapter 5 tonight, we have one of the most remarkable conversions in the whole of the Bible. You see, my friend, that's very important tonight because Jesus said, except you be converted, not except you become good living. A lot of people say, oh, you need to become good living into heaven. Listen, turning good living won't get you into heaven. The Lord Jesus says, except you be converted. That means repenting of sin. That means putting our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Except you be converted and become as little children, ye shall in no ways enter into the kingdom of heaven. And in Mark chapter 5 tonight, we have a remarkable conversion. Here tonight, we have a man tonight who had a wonderful experience. And that is ex his experience was that he came in contact with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to know tonight, my dear friend, the greatest encounter you'll ever have in life is to have an encounter with the Lord Jesus. I want you to know this man tonight had a soul-saving, life-changing encounter. You know, this man was in a terrible way in Mark 5. He was a man tonight who could neither be tied nor tamed. He was demon-possessed, physically, mentally, spiritually, uh, whatever other illy there is. This man was beyond human help. This man was totally in dire straits until he met the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to know tonight there's no problem. There's no circumstance. There's no sin there's no bondage, there's no shackle that the Lord Jesus Christ cannot set you free from. Whosoever the Son sets free is free indeed. Do you believe that? Because I certainly believe it. And you know, friend, tonight, this man, you know, this man was so far gone, he was even uh, cutting himself, he was, he was uh, uh, self-harming himself. This man wanted to die. Do you know there's many people like that tonight? Many people who want to die because they don't want to live. You know, Tracy and I were talking to a man last, when was it, Tuesday night, and he was telling us he met a man with his whole arms cut off himself, self-harming. This was a grown man, a man in his 40s, and when this other friend of ours asked him, why is he all cut, you know what he said, I don't want to live anymore. I want you to know tonight there's people in Kilkeel like that. There's people tonight who don't want to live. You know why? Death doesn't scare them, but life scares them. And they're so far down tonight, and they're so low, that that's all they want to do. They want to die, that they want to go on. That was this man's condition. He didn't want to live. He thought life for him wasn't worth living. And then there came the wonderful conversion, because the Lord Jesus Christ set this man free. This man got life that day. And I want to tell you, friend, tonight, you can have life tonight. The Lord Jesus said in John 10 and 10, I am come that you might have life. I haven't come to give you religion. I haven't come to give you anything but life. And that's abundant life. And my friend tonight, you can have that life tonight in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then there came the change. Boys, what a wonderful change in his life was wrought to that day when the Lord Jesus Christ touched him and healed him and restored him and saved him. And I want you to know, friend tonight, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. And I can tell you tonight, the man who has an encounter with the Lord Jesus is a, is a changed person. But then there was the commission, because he was told, go home and tell, uh, go home, the Lord Jesus says, to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion upon thee. You know the Lord Jesus commissioned this man to go home first. Go home to thy friends and tell them the great things the Lord hath done for you. What the Lord hath done for you. This man was to tell his family, this man was to tell his friends that what has happened to him, religion had nothing to do with it. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. And this man tonight had a remarkable story to tell. And I've come tonight to tell you my story. 
My story tonight, how I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I want you to know tonight, I am what I am by the grace of God. Religion done nothing for me. In fact, religion more confused me than done anything else. And I want to start tonight by telling you how I came to know the Lord Jesus. Well, first of all, my life story is like any story. It has a beginning. And my story begins at the day when I was born. And that was a wee while ago. Do you know, folks, from the day I was born, I was born the 18th of August, 1960, whatever it was. 1965, that makes me now, what, 24 and a wee bit. Quite a wee bit. I was born on the 18th of August, 1965, at a very young age. And believe it or not, I was born before my first birthday. I was that young. But I was born in 1965, and I was born... Yes, Penny's just dropping now, <laughs> I was born in 1965, and I was born in South Tyrone Hospital. I've now closed it because of that. I was born in 1965, and I was born in, uh, in South Tyrone Hospital. And believe it or believe it or not, I was born prematurely. Uh, you know, 1965 was a big year. That was the year Winston Churchill died. Somebody told me Winston Churchill had to get out of the world to allow me into the world. This world wasn't big enough for the two of us. But you know, I was born in 1965, and I was born prematurely. I wasn't meant to be born into September, but thing complicated occasions happened with my mother at that time, and I had to be born uh, uh, almost three or four weeks early. And I was born slightly over four pound weight. I put on a few pounds since that, and, uh, and I don't really remember this, but I remember my mother telling me I was put in an incubator for seven weeks. She wasn't allowed to touch me or anything. I was, uh, I was chewed, sorry, tubed up and I was wired up. Well, I'm still wired up, but the tubes are out. But you know, friends, this evening, you know, I often think of that. Even though I was not we incubator, it was touch and go for a wee while whether I would survive or not, but you know, the Lord had his hand upon me. The Lord had his hand upon me. Do you know what the words of God says in Jeremiah? Jeremiah says, before I formed thee, God said to him, in the belly I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I adorned thee to be a prophet. You know, I believe, friend, God had his hand upon my life. You know, God knows everything tonight. God knows everything. And I was born into a very good home. It was a home where I was loved and it was a home where I was cared for very, very much indeed. And I want to pay tribute to my parents tonight, to my mother and to my late father, because Brian and I both lacked for nothing, both of us needed for nothing, and both of us were loved and cared for by good parents. We were both born, and I was born and reared up in a wee county to own village called Ochnacloy. That's the wee village of the wide street. Have you ever been in it? You have been in it. I can notice that the head's going. You've been blessed if you've been in it. And uh, that's the wee village, the wide street. And we were sent to church every Sunday. We were Church of Ireland people. And, uh, and it's good to see an old Church of Ireland people in here. You always can tell the Church of Ireland people because they're the ones that are smiling. They are indeed. And they're the ones that can sing well. Well, we were Church of Ireland people. And uh, we were brought up in uh, our home was a home where you, you were sent to church on Sunday school every Sunday. I'll tell you something else about our home. Our home was a home tonight where you were taught to respect your parents. I can tell you, it wasn't that the, that the parents were taught to respect their children. You were taught to respect your parents. And I want you young people to know this tonight. Respect your parents. Because I'll tell you this, your parents will be there for you when nobody else will be there for you. There's one thing I learned through life when you get into trouble. And I got into trouble the odd time. And when everybody else scarpered, my parents were there to pick up the pieces. It wasn't that it wasn't bad trouble or anything else, but you'll find young people that your parents are your best friends. But as I said, I was brought along and uh, we were brought up in that home and we're always brought and taught up that you had to go to church on Sunday school. You know, you had to be in a bad way that you didn't get, get out, to get out of going to church or Sunday school. You had about half dead to get out of it, or almost three quarters dead in our house, because you're always made to go to church and to go to Sunday school. But I want to pay tribute also to my home as well. Ten Sydney Crescent, it wasn't Kensington Palace. Ten Sydney Crescent, nothing to wasn't Buckingham Palace. Ten Sydney Crescent for me was home. 
and it was home, and it's still home because my mother is still there. And, uh, and you know, I look back to those days when I was brought up and reared in Sydney Crescent, and those were good days, and those were wonderful days. But you know, friends, I was brought up in that home, uh, in a home where we were sent to church and sent to Sunday school every Sunday. But you know, friends, this evening, tonight, you know, going to church and going to Sunday school doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't get you into heaven. The Bible says tonight, ye must be born again. And we were brought up in that, in that environment where we were, we were to be brought up to, to, to go to church every Lord's Day and to go to our Sunday school. You know, I hadn't really no time for church Sunday, or Sunday school because I had really no time for the things of God. When we went to Sunday school, I was more interested in how Spurs done. We all talked about how our football team, we never listened to the teacher. We were more interested in what how our team's done. How did Chelsea do? Oh, yes, very good. How did you do? Yes. How did Manchester United do yesterday? Oh, stuffed again. Yes. And that was the course of the conversation. We had no interest. I had no interest in the things, but there was two Sunday school teachers that stick out in my memory. And that's Isabel Dixon, Miss Isabel Dixon and Victor McCune because they were different. They talked to us about this needing of being saved. They told us about how the Lord Jesus went to the cross. They told us what something that really stuck in my memory, even though I had no interest. See, maybe you're here tonight, friend, and you have no interest. You've come perhaps maybe out of uh, the goodness of being invited, and you've come with no intention but perhaps to listen to what I'm going to say, well, you know, friend, that's how I was. I had no interest in what the Sunday school teachers or what the wee clergyman was saying. In fact, half time I fell asleep when he was preaching, just the way some of you are just now. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. But you know, friends, tonight, that's how it was. And then you move up into teenage years. Boys, them's the great years. Them's the years of experience and the, and the years of worrying for parents. You know, the teenage years are the years where you try things and you, and you want to find out life for yourself because once you hit 13, you think you've turned into a man right away. And I remember my 13th birthday. I remember it well. And I remember going round in the milk cart along with my cousin Ashley Reed, and him and I were out delivering milk that day when I was 13. I thought whenever I hit 13, I was a man. But you know, through the teenage years, you begin to... Find an attraction, don't you, for the things of the world? And I was no different from anybody else. I was wanting to try the discos, and I was wanting to try this, and I was wanting to try that. And you know, my dear friend tonight, I tried it all. I tried the discos, and I tried the dances, and, and listen, I enjoyed them. Do you know why I enjoyed them? Because there's pleasure out there. There's pleasure. You know, friend, I used to drink, and I used to smoke and do all the things, and I'm not saying that to glorify anybody. I'm saying that to my shame, right? but that's part of my story. I found satisfaction in them things. And you want to know something like, I did find satisfaction. And that's why tonight our discos and our pubs and our clubs are packed tonight, because there's pleasure in sin. And some of us need to realize that tonight. Some of us that have been saved for years, because there is pleasure in sin. And I tried it all, and, and you know, our wee village, we had our own blood and thunder band, believe it or not, and I used to play in it. I used to be the fluter. And I played in the back row outside right, and it was my job. You know, you walk up and say, keep that back row straight there. I was to keep the, to keep the row straight. And it was absolutely wonderful out in the nights of the band. I've I done all these things to try and seek enjoyment and all the rest of it. But then it came one night, one Wednesday night it was, I remember it well. I was sitting in Ivan Corns' bar that night. We called him Curly because he hadn't a hair in his head. That's why he got Curly. That people don't call me Curly. And I remember that night I was drinking two, I was drinking two pints of, sorry, two bottles of tannins in a pint glass. And I used to love going in there on a Wednesday night. You know, we used to go to the Valley Hotel on a Friday night, Silver Birch and Oman on a Saturday night, and to eat Curly's on a Wednesday night. And it was lovely to get in there just to talk to the old fellas and to hear them telling the old stories. I can remember that night well. There was Ivan and the wife who were behind the bar. Big Bob Clark was to my left. To my right was Roy Holland. 
then it was Janet McKee, then it was Willie Watt. And do you know someone tonight? Every one of those people now are gone. Gone. But that night sitting on that bar stool, watching the bubbles going up the glass that night, do you know something, friend? Something entered my head. I remember asking myself the question, is this it? Is this life? Is this what life is really all about? You know, friend, I wasn't a drug addict or I wasn't a drunkard or any of these. I was what you would call the local idiot. And I remember that night sitting in that bar stool and looking at the bubbles going up the glass and I remember saying to myself, is this it? I wonder, am I speaking to someone here tonight? And that's exactly how you are. Because all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I felt this emptiness. I felt, I felt this void. Do you know I, what it was like? It was as like tonight that nothing in this world could fulfill the longing of my heart. Do you know something, friend? There's nothing in this world tonight that could fulfill the longing of my heart. And I'll tell you something else. There's nothing in this world tonight can fulfill the longing of your heart. I suddenly realized tonight sin could no longer scratch where I itched. Because you see, friend, tonight, that night, sitting in that bar stool, looking back now, that's where God began to speak with me. Do you know, friend, tonight, God can speak to you in any place? That night, sitting in the diamond bar in Achenachloy, that's where God spoke to me six months prior to my conversion. And friend, for those six months, my life felt so empty, and it felt so meaningless. And the boys used to call around and they used to ask me, would you fancy coming out tonight? We're going to the dance or we're going to some disco or we're going to some this and that and the other thing. And I had no interest in going. But then there came a gospel mission to Achnachloy, you know, and it was called International Youth Bridge. And, and mind you, I had no time for church or anything, but I certainly had no time for missions. And at that particular time, I worked for a man called Derek Lone. He's the, he's the Nissan dealer up under in Achnachloy still. Remember, you know, when I started to work for Derek Lone, Derek Lone used to witness to me. He used to tell me about my needing of being, being saved and about coming to the Lord Jesus Christ and how we all need to prepare to meet God. And I'll tell you something now, folk. I thought his head was cut. I thought his head was cut. What are you coming out with this nonsense? You're, you're Presbyterian, Derek. I'm, I'm Church of Ireland, and, and I'm Christian, and I'm baptized, and... And that's what I believed was going to take me to heaven. I'll tell you what I had a problem with. Do you know what I had a problem with? I had a problem with professing Christians. Maybe that's you tonight. You have a problem with some professing Christians. Running about with a big Bible, but their life doesn't prove that what they're really confessing. And I wonder tonight, is that what you're struggling with? Hypocrites. Because that was my problem. And this man used to witness to me and talk to me about my need about being saved. And I used to point the finger at such and such of this and such and such of that and such and such of the other thing. And do you know something, friend? He says, George, you're right. You're right. But this is one thing he did say one day. He says, George, you need to get your eyes off them, boys, and get your eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this mission come and he began to plead with me and ask me, oh, could you go to the mission? And I kept running, kept making excuses, you know, as you do. And, but Derek Lone was one of these men that never gave up too easy, and he kept on asking and asking and asking until one day I ran out of excuses. And then Norman and Mark and Noel, they were the three boys that worked along with me in the garage at that time. And they were for going, well, I says, well, I'll not go, and I'll not be going on my own. I'll go to the mission anyway, and I'll get him off my back. So off we went that night in Norman's wee Vauxhall Chevette. Norman was the driver. And believe it or believe it not, Norman is sitting in this meeting. And he was driving the wee Vauxhall Chevette. And it was like that wee film, you know, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Do you remember that? And, it was, and we were heading up to the mission that night. And I remember getting out of the car, Norman's wee Vox, Vauxhall Chevette. It was a three-door. Was it, Norman? Two-door. Two-door. Sorry, there was no boot in there. Right. She was a two-door. And I heeled her to the back of it. And Norman and Mark and Noel, they went into the mission. They couldn't go in. 
he says, I couldn't go in under listening to that there. They were ramming the Bible and all this here and thumping the Bible. And, but you know, friend, the devil has many ways to try and stop you. And I remember one night, Paul, that night Paul could come out. Paul could come out. And he said to me, George, listen, I promise that nobody will say anything to you if you come into the mission. He says, Paul, to tell you the honest truth, I need a smoke to, before I go in to cool the nerves. Isn't it funny how you depend on these old things to try and settle you down a bit? I took my cigarette, smoked it, stamped it out, and in we went that night. But there was a group singing. There was a group singing. I just can't remember the group. And that group began to sing what the Emmanuel were singing about tonight. They began to sing about the love of God. They began to sing about the Lord Jesus Christ. And as they began to sing, I began to listen and I began to think, hold on a minute. He says, I know this is what's wrong with me. This is what's wrong with me. No, friend, think maybe that's what's wrong with you tonight. You see, friends, sin, sin's the greatest curse of all. And I can tell you, friend, the Bible does talk about sin. It talks about the pleasures of sin tonight, but the pleasures of sin are only but for a season. And I wonder tonight, is this you? You feel empty. You feel alone tonight. And my friend, that night, God opened my ears. And maybe tonight, God opens your ears this evening. Then that night, there was a wee Church of Iron clergyman got up to preach. I'll tell you what you called him. You called him Brandon McCarthy. He was a converted Roman Catholic. Brandon McCarthy preached that night in John chapter 14 and verse 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. And I'll tell you, for once in my life, I listened to what this man had to say. That man said that night, something that I thought I would never hear a Church of Ireland minister say. He said tonight, you may be christened, but that's not going to take you to heaven. You may be confirmed, but that's not going to take you to heaven. And right away, he switched to the famous footballer, George Best. He said George Best had fame, he had skill, he had good looks, he had all the money, all the things that a young footballer would dream of heaven. Well, he says, I've got two of them things. I've got his name, and I've got the good looks. But this is what he said. He said, with all these things, with all these things, he was still useless without, sorry, he was still useless as far as scoring goals is concerned because all these things didn't matter if he hadn't the ball in his possession. He says the most important thing to George Best was not just the skill, but the ball. No ball, no goal. And this is how the Reverend Brenton McCarthy put it. He says you may be the best young person in Ochnacloy. You may go to your church, you may be christened, you may be confirmed, but unless you've got the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, you'll never score the goal of eternal life. You know what happened that night? I could see clearly where I was. I was in sin tonight. I was being held tonight by sin's chain. And I, for the first time in my life, I realized tonight that the Lord Jesus died for me. He spoke that night of the cross. He spoke that night of the one that was crucified at the place called Calvary. He spoke that night of the one who shed his blood there. He spoke that night as him, the one on that cross tonight, to, that needs to be our Savior. And my friend, I need you to know tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ needs to be your Savior because my friend is the only one that can forgive sin. He's the only one that can save our souls from going to that awful place called hell. And that's why he died on the cross, my friend. He died there because he died to take your place. And he died there. And he suffered there and he bled there. My friend, because he loves you. I want you to know tonight, God loves you tonight. In spite of your past, in spite of your sin, God loves you tonight, and God is here to meet with you. And I want you to know that the very Savior that died on Calvary's cross and rose again is in this very meeting, and tonight He wants 
to have that encounter with you. And remember that night very well. I can see it in my mind's eye. The Reverend McCarthy says, Now bow your head, and if you want to ask the Lord Jesus into your heart, do so. And that night I prayed that prayer. And you know the verse of that hymn tells my testimony it does. I came to Jesus as I was, weary, worn, and sad, but I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. He has, you know. I can't understand some of these Christians walking about with long faces. But I can tell you, friend, when the Savior comes in, he gives us someone to smile about, doesn't he? And he gives someone for a manual to sing about and for boys like me to shout about. Because I can tell you, friend, tonight I tried the broken cisterns in the waters field, and I can say tonight, now none but Christ can satisfy none other name for me, for there's love and there's life and everlasting joy, Lord Jesus found in me. And that's true tonight. And you see, Norman and Mark and Noel, every one of us, there's four of us headed off that night, and four of us have got saved. And friend, in fact, I was talking to Mark yesterday in the beach in Cranfield. And I want to tell you, four of us worked in Derek Loans at the time. Well, sorry, three of us did. And we used to listen to Steve right in the afternoon. Do you remember that radio station, Steve, right in the afternoon? I see some of you nodding the head. Do you remember that? We used to listen to that. Well, it went from Steve right in the afternoon to Willie McRae in the afternoon. Because our music taste all changed, you know. It went from status quo to Willie McRae. It went from Queen to Joe Peden. And it went from... I don't know who else, from Elvis Presley to Emmanuel, but Emmanuel had no CDs then. But you know, friend, tonight, that's the change. You know, Derek Lone's garage was talked about. Garage, Derek Lone's garage, you know, Norman and me, we used to, when we were serviced in the cars, we used to slip with gospel tracks everywhere. Every car got serviced, we were slipping with tracks everywhere. But you know, friend, Derek Lone's garage was talked about because everybody was saying, that place is not right. That's more like a gospel center than it is a garage. But you know something, friend? That's the change Jesus brings. You know, friends, this evening, I want you to know tonight, there's nobody like Christ. I want to stand here and testify to the very fact, I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad tonight that the Lord Jesus in my heart is my Savior. And I can tell you, friend, I would not take a million pounds to go back to that night before what happened. Because do you see, the night I got saved, I didn't know whether I walked home, flew home, or floated home. Because I'll tell you, somebody filled my life with joy. And I can tell you, he gave me a life worth living. And then, you know, life goes on, and, and you know, the Lord, the Lord gets better. And you know, friend, it takes you to grow as a Christian. And I remember joining the local faith mission prayer meeting. And I remember going there, and I remember joining the faith mission prayer union, and that's where I grew as a Christian. And there's one thing I learned as a Christian. You need to have fellowship with other Christians to grow as a Christian. And I remember after we were saved, you know, we would have went to every meeting there was in the country. There was the cleft, there were Sam Workman missions, all we nearly went to the chapel if we could get in. We couldn't get enough meetings. But that's how you grew. And my friend tonight, listen to me. If you're young in the faith tonight, you need to be in fellowship. You need to be in fellowship with God's people if you want to grow as a Christian. And then you get to that stage, fellows and men, gentlemen in life. You've got to look about the other half. And that's a big handling. But here's a wee thought now for everybody, both boy and girl here tonight. Do you see if you're looking for a partner in life, a wife or a husband, make sure tonight to love the Lord just as much as you. I remember praying one night, one Friday night, I says, Lord, Lord, you know, you know that one for me. And I pray, Lord, that you'll lead her to me someday soon. That's a fact. And one night I went to a Christian social and, and I was standing beside a boy called John Reed that night and I, I turned around and I seen these two young lassies stand. Well, they were the same age as myself. And I says, here, I'll go for... Uh, I, you take that one, I'll take the other one. And you know what, you know what my wee prayer was? I says, Lord, this girl, if she's for me, she'll start witnessing to me. I want you to show, I want you to show me she loves the Lord more than me. And her and I started talking, and the first thing she started to do was witness. I says, what's your name, dear? That's just the way I talked to her. What's your name, dear? 
Tracy. Oh, I says, tell you the truth, I fell for right away. I fell for right away. And I asked her that night, hey, Tracy, could, could, any chance of leaving you home? And she said no. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. First time refusal. I says, why well, cannot leave you home for? I thought there was someone maybe, maybe my tie wasn't sitting straight or something. She says, no, I'm driving. She says, you can't leave me home. Oh, I says, right. Well, the whole thing was, unless I could put her car into the boot of my car, I couldn't get her home. I says, where do you live, Tracy? She says, I live in Guildford. Well, I thought you said Milford. And I'm quite glad I didn't, I didn't get leaving her home for I was only a quarter of a tank of petrol, and I couldn't have got her, got her home and got home again. But anyway, Tracy and I, we were friends. We had a whole crowd around us, you know, and we were all friends. And, and things were a wee bit awkward between her and me. You know, when you, when you asked her out and she refused, you know, it left things a wee bit awkward. But then again, nine months down the line, I said to myself, right, if I don't make the move, if I don't make the move here, some other old boy's going to get her. And I remember one night, sitting in the car, it was Locke's car park and pulled her down. I got her on my own. And I said, Tracy, I step out in faith. It was a step of faith, and, and here's my chat up line. I says, Tracy, I'm stepping out in faith here. Will you go with me? And before I drew breath, she says, I will. And that was on the 4th of December, 1988, and her and I started going out together. And we weren't going out a week. I began to say, you know, this is definitely the girl for me. And I says, before I ask, go any further, I need to bring her up and let her see my parents. So anyway, I brought her up to Nothing O'Cloy, and she wasn't in Nothing O'Cloy in her life until this Sunday afternoon. And I took her out for a real romantic walk. And you know where I took her to? I took her down the graveyard behind our church. <laughs> That's a fact. And I took her half, of course, there's a lovely view behind our church. There is indeed, there's a lovely view. And I remember taking her down halfway, halfway down the graveyard, and I remember looking over this wee grassy area there. And I says, tell me this, Tracy. How do you fancy lying with our wounds? <laughs> Oh, she says, she says, what do you mean? And he says, that's, that's our wee plot over there, you know. Will you not give me the honors of, of laying with us someday? And she took me by the hand. You know what she says to me? She says to me, George, you've lost the plot. <laughs> but anyway, I got her to say yes, and naturally enough, it didn't take much convincing. And both her and I were married on the 24th of, uh, the 24th of March, 1990. Boys, said, boys, there's a jail sentence completely over, but I would have been out by now. But you know something, my friend, I can tell you, I thank God for Tracy. Because I'll tell you, she's been an encouragement to me. Do you know when you're involved in the Lord's work, you need someone who's an encouragement and who loves the Lord, listen to me, and who's, ex who's ex excited about the Lord is what I am. And I'll tell you, friend, she's been behind me the whole way. And you know... It's so important, young person, tonight, to make sure you're going to spend the rest of your life with someone that really loves the Lord. You know, friends, this evening, the Lord has blessed us with two children, Rebecca and Nathan. And it's good that you pray for your children because if there's a generation of children that needs to be prayed for, it's today's generation. But you know, friend, I wasn't too long saved. I realized I wasn't saved this that I was saved to serve. I'm soon, I'm soon finished. I can hear the teapot singing in there. And I remember becoming an itinerant preacher, and I remember being in, starting out, and, and God brought us into different meetings and fellowships and missions and all the rest of it. You know, friend, listen, I'll tell you something now that I learned when I become a Christian. You've only got one life. Only one life, and it'll soon be passed. And it's only what's done for Christ will last. And I want to thank God tonight and I give Him all the glory because of all what the Lord has been doing through our ministry and through our missions and all the rest of our bygone days. And I give Him all the glory tonight for bringing me to Kilkeel. I'm here nine months now. Boys, that's, that's just like a flash, isn't it? I know you're saying it's like a lifetime, but it's like a flash to me. And I thank God tonight because God sealed this ministry because within a week, Two lovely people were saved. And that's William and Wendy. And it's lovely to see them here tonight. Where are you? You're down there. And it's lovely to see others who've been saved since they've been here. David and Emma and different ones. But you know, friend, that's the Lord tonight. 
And I want you to know tonight the Lord is still on the throne. And the Lord is still working. And the Lord is still blessing. And perhaps there's someone here tonight and you serve the Lord. Listen, don't give up tonight. The Lord's still on the throne. The Lord's still blessing. But you know, friend, this evening, I'll tell you something about the Christian life. It's not an easy life. People think tonight it's an real easy going life. I'll tell you, it's not tonight because the moment you get saved, you realize there's a devil. And tonight, my dear, un, my dear unsafe friend, tonight, you think of this. Think tonight of where you're going to go when you die because your day to day will come. The Bible says tonight it's appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. You see, maybe you think tonight once you die you go into the ground and that's it. It's not it tonight. Because my friend, after death there's the eternal issues. It's either heaven or hell. And it's vitally important, my dear friend, as I bring this story to a close, it's vitally important tonight what you do with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll tell you why that is. Because it'll determine what he will do with you when it comes your time to die. You see, my friend tonight, your good works isn't going to save your soul. Your church cannot save you. Your minister cannot save you. I can't save you. Friend, only Christ can save you. And I invite you to come tonight. Listen, I'm on my way to heaven because of the one that died for me and rose again. And I want you to come tonight to my Savior, the one that saved me, the one that changed me, can save you tonight and can change you tonight. He can. And I trust tonight, my friend, my prayer is that you'll come to know the Lord Jesus, that you'll come tonight to trust George McConnell, Savior. And tonight, this very night could be the night where your journey for heaven will begin. How do I come? You just come how I came. I remember that night I'm finished. You know, friend, I wasn't dressed in a shirt and tie that night. I was dressed in a pair of jeans and a pair of Dr. Martin boots and an old UDR jumper on me. And ten cigarettes in my pocket. And I'll tell you, friend, that night when I came, the Lord Jesus came in. Do you know how you come tonight? Just as you are. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relief. And I wonder tonight, will you come? Will you come to the one that died to save you? Will you come tonight to the one that rose? and who's alive to be your Savior this evening.